Hey, Bible students, did you know that what is going on in the world today will lead to the capture of Jerusalem and that the city will actually fall? You see, that's the difference between just listening to commentators and knowing what your Bible says. And since we're welcoming Bible students who want to read their Bible and see for sure what's going to happen, that's a pretty dramatic thing that must come out of what's going on. It may not be Putin, as we've said, who will lead the Russian army into Jerusalem, but someone from Russia will lead that army there and will do what the scripture says. Look at it. Zechariah chapter 14. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming and your spoil we will be divided in the midst. I'll gather all nations to battle against Jerusalem, and the city shall be taken. There you are. The city shall be taken. The houses rifled, the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. So very, very dramatic things are going to happen, and no doubt they're going to influence us all. But the question we want to address today is this one. Why does the God of Israel send Russia against his own people? You see, this is what Ezekiel 38 verse 16 has been telling us. And Bible students have the advantage of going to see what else God says to see clearly why he does this. So, yes, we've been reading from Ezekiel 38 verse 16 says, You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land, so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. Now, you see, you can't miss this. Well, I guess you could, really. But the idea is don't miss it. Read the Bible for what it says. You will come up against my people of Israel. I will bring you against my land. That's the way God introduces this. And that's been largely absent from the discussion that's going on about what's going on in the world today in Ukraine and Russia and leading to Israel. So God says he does this for his name's sake. Now, we need to investigate that a little, but you need to go back a couple chapters leading up to Ezekiel 38, because in those chapters, I think they would probably start from Ezekiel 33. 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, and 39. Those are the chapters where God speaks to the prophet Ezekiel, telling him about what's going to happen to Israel in the latter days. So in chapter 36, he says in verse 22, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, I do not this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. Now, we would miss this idea entirely if we were just looking at what's going on in the world today, what's being made out of the news. God's doing something for his name's sake. God has been out of the of discussion, but God is doing this so that he will be brought back into the discussion as he thinks it's right that it should be done. I do not this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake. I will sanctify my great name. You can't miss it here. And it follows right through to Ezekiel chapter 39. Now, God said some things, probably quite unpleasant, probably things people didn't want to hear, especially the Jewish people. But look at what he says in Jeremiah 16, verse 16. Now, this is against his people because they have not followed him and not kept him in their minds. Behold, I will send for many fishermen, says the Lord, and they shall fish them. And afterward, I will send many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and under the holes of the rocks. 
Now, why would God ever use those terms to describe how he will persecute his people for them leaving him? Why would he send for fishermen who would fish them and hunters will hunt them? Well, there's one piece missing in this picture, and there it is. And this comes from Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. I visited that Holocaust memorial. I've seen what Israel has to say about the Holocaust. And one thing I went through to find is what they had to say about their God. How did they see their God figuring into the Holocaust? Well, I went in twice to see if I could even find the name God in the Holocaust Memorial. And it seems to me that what has been done there and has been done in other memorials is to exclude the name of God. Not that Israel is totally godless, but it seems that they either do not want to or they cannot explain how their God dealt with them during those years. Well, that cattle car is exactly what we would do to transport animals. And obviously many people shipping their animals to market would put them in a, a cattle car like that, whether they're sheep or their uh, cattle or their oxen, etc. He would put them, at, which would lead to a cattle car going to a place, a slaughterhouse. Now, doesn't that really make the word of God come alive? These people were hunted by the Nazis who were after them, looking, trying to find them when they were hiding here and there throughout Europe. And God says he would hunt them. And what did they hunt them to do? Well, they hunted them to kill them. Just like animals are put in a car like that and sent to market. It's a very dramatic detail but my point is it's missing in the discussion about what's happening in the world today. And it needs to be there because it's in God's word, part of the things which we're seeing taking place. But in Ezekiel 39, which is the chapter that sort of closes out in Ezekiel, the picture of what God's doing with his people, it says in verse 7, so I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. That's what God's going to do. He's going to bring his people back to him. Other prophets have said, yes, they will say that their God is now their God, and they will use the name of God, and they will talk about God in their everyday conversation. And God will consider them his people. I want to show you the assurance that God has given us that these words in Ezekiel are right. And that these words in Ezekiel are for the people living today. You see, in Ezekiel 37, just prior to the chapter we've used so often, Ezekiel 38, it says in verse 12, Therefore prophesy, say unto the people of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Now, God has been doing that, and we've been seeing it in the history of the Jewish people in 1948 dramatically. The nation of Israel is proclaimed again in the world. In the year 1967, Jerusalem, which is now in Jewish hands again after all those years of not being so. But one of the dramatic things was the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls about that time, just a little after the proclamation of the State of Israel. And in the years of the early 1950s, when they were looking for them and finding them. But one of the sensational finds was found at Masada. And that's where they went digging to find scrolls, if they could, after finding many in other places in Israel. They went down there because they knew that the Jews inhabited that palace that was down there uh, at the end of, of uh, the siege of against Jerusalem in AD 70. And they held on to it for a few years after that. And they wondered if there might be any scrolls there. Well, one of the sensational finds was buried under a synagogue. And that's a burial ground for holy books, like old scrolls. They were buried under a synagogue. They, don't, they weren't burned. They weren't thrown in the garbage heap. They were given an honorable burial. So they dug. 
and they dug in a place by digging up the floor and looking to see some of the places under it, which looked like the earth had been removed and the earth had been at least mixed up. And they dug down very carefully and not finding a jar with scrolls in it, they found the remnants of an old scroll and laid there for 2000 years and still it hadn't been corrupted and, and gone away into the dust so that no one would know about it. And they could even decipher the reading of it. It was from Ezekiel chapter 37, the very chapter that God said he would take his people and open their graves and bring them from their graves back into the land of Israel. And what did they do in Masada? They opened a Geniza, a grave for a scroll. And what did they find? They found the very part of Ezekiel that talked about the revival of Israel. God taking their bones and bringing them out of the nation, so to speak, back to their nation of Israel. Those are sensational things. And if you want to read about it, it's found in this book called Masada by Yagal Yadin, who documents that at very fine I'm discussing with you. And it can be found on Amazon and even in Amazon news books last time I checked. So God will save his people. They will go through a tremendous upheaval when the Russian leader brings his nation and the other nations with them into Israel to do what God says they will do. But at the end of it, in chapter 39 of Ezekiel, verses 28 and 29, it says, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also brought them back to their land, and none of them captive there any longer. And I will not hide my face from them anymore. For I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. And that is the dramatic ending. And it is a, an incredible story for people who will want to see what's going on in the world today to be able to read God's word. God says that this will lead to the nations of the world honoring him. In a companion passage in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 22, it says, yes. Many people, strong nations, shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts in those days, ten men from every nation of the languages shall, of the nations shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. And notice, Bible students, that's not saying they're going to go with the Jews because of the Jews. It's because they recognize Israel's God is now with them. And that's the key thing for this prophecy to be fulfilled. So just in conclusion, why does the God of Israel send a Russian army against his people? One, the God of Israel will put hooks into the jaws of a leader of Russia. He will, he will take him captive to do this. Russia will covetously follow their evil plan against the Jewish people. Three, the people of Israel have departed from their God and have served other gods. Number four, through the evil work of Gog, Yahweh, the God of Israel, will humble his people. And five, all the nations of the world will recognize this event and submit to Yahweh. Well, isn't that a, a remarkable record to read and to know of? at the time things are happening in this world like they are. Bible students, continue to study your Bible. And Lord willing, we'll be back with another video soon to tell you what's going to happen to the nation of Russia. Until then, may God bless your reading of his word. Thank you.